South Africa looks beautiful on the surface, with its flourishing economy and diverse culture, but it is rooted in an oppressive past that plagues it today. When I returned to South Africa in, uh, at the end of 2001 and decided I would take over this farm, I was immediately thrown into a kind of vortex of history. Um, you can't avoid it, and you can avoid it at your peril. If you want to, the place to be viable, you immediately realize there is a bloody complicated history here that I have to come to grips with. The Republic of South Africa is home to over 47 million people. With 11 official languages, its unique makeup encompasses a wide array of cultures and religious beliefs. One key to understanding its history and likely future is to understand its legacy of slavery. Mark Soames is a South African wine farmer and owner of the Soames Delta Wine Estate located in the spectacular Franschhoek Valley of the Western Cape. Shortly after taking over his family's land in 2001, he became fascinated with its story. The idea occurred to me that we should have a museum on this farm which tells the real story of what happened here. Because the personal histories of the farm workers was bound up with the history of this farm because they've all lived here, not only their entire lives, but their generations that they've lived here. To begin the process of creating his Museum of the Cape, Soames brought in a historian to take oral histories of the families who live on the farm. He then began to look deeper. We brought the archaeologists in here who started to dig on the farm and found the material evidence of that past that I'm referring to. Suddenly they were digging up literally their own history. The vineyard laborers and archaeologists worked together to uncover artifacts of human habitation on the farm from long before its founding in 1690 to the 20th century. The people who lived here, the Khoikhoi and the San, are the closest relatives, the most direct descendants of the original people, the original human beings. You know, this is, this is the cradle of humanity. The Khoisan are the indigenous hunting and herding people of southern Africa. As colonization increased in the Cape, these native people lost access to grazing and hunting territories. With the crash of their delicate social system, the Khoisan were forced to become hired laborers on the land or to flee into the hinterland. Few in number and widely scattered, they could not provide the labor needed to create a European colony in the Western Cape. It would be the Dutch who would introduce slavery into what would become South Africa importing enslaved subjects from their far-flung empire beginning in March 1658. Under the direction of Commander Jan van Riebeck, the Dutch East India Company, then the world's largest trading company, known as the VOC, claimed Table Bay and what would become Cape Town in 1652. They established a fresh fruit and vegetable garden, a refreshment station for their merchant ships, a logical stopping point on their route from the Netherlands to their Eastern Empire in India and Indonesia. What was originally intended to be a small refreshment station grew into a thriving independent town. The Castle of Good Hope was built as a fort on the foreshore of Table Bay to serve as the headquarters for the VOC in Africa. In order to maintain the growth of the colony, the VOC imported thousands of slaves to work on farms, in houses, and on the docks. The farming of this land, the, the development of this land as a farm, as a wine farm, involved slave labor. All of them were brought here against their will from very far away under you know, the most appalling circumstances imaginable. In confronting all of that history, you then have to look at, well, what are we going to do to change it? The original VOC fruit and vegetable plots, located at the top of Adderley Street, are now a beautiful public park and arboretum. The company gardens provided fruit, fresh and vegetables to the Dutch. Today, children play around the flowers and adults lounge on the grass. 
it is mostly forgotten that this peaceful recreational area was once the reason why Cape Town was founded. They need to commemorate the garden. They need to say that this is the spot where slaves did their labor, where they labored the soil for the company. Because without the slaves, the company would never, ever survive. In 1679, the less fertile areas of the garden were sold. And on this land, the slave lodge was built. The conditions were harsh and inhumane. There's no windows in, no windows out. They couldn't escape. This was a holding place. People always say about the slaves lived. They didn't live here. They were held here. The only light came from slits in the walls covered with iron bars. These slits remained open to the elements, and slaves often lived in wet clothes in cold weather. They were crammed together like livestock, and the stench was described as unbearable. Food was scarce, and slaves developed tuberculosis and other illnesses due to these conditions. On Spin Street at the back of the slave lodge, a plaque marks the location of the original slave tree. It was under this tree that an estimated 100,000 slaves in Cape Town were sold. Mothers were taken away from daughters. Lovers were taken away from each other. Fathers were taken away from their children. Now, just imagine that whole... It's explosive. I, I, I can't even imagine it now. You know, it's explosive. And never to see each other again. For over 170 years, slaves were sold to work in the houses and workshops of the wealthy in Cape Town, and to work on farms and vineyards in the surrounding countryside. 